you, John and Sherry and worship team. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kevin. I'm the next gym pastor here at our Beaumont campus. Good morning to those of you who are watching online. Good morning to North. Happy freezing uh, Valentine's Day, right? Valentine's, Tines with an N, right? It's cute when kids say happy Valentine's. Not as cute when you hear adults say it like every year. I, every year I hear an adult say happy, it's Valentine's Day. So if, in case you didn't know, just if you're realizing that for the first time right now, just keep a poker face, fellas. Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, well, welcome to, to you, the few, the proud, the very, very cold who decided to come this morning. Uh, we're glad that you're here with us. Uh, I was talking to Clay Jones before this service uh, and talking about how hilarious it, wa- it would be if we talked to some of our friends in Canada, like Jason Johnson, about how everybody's freaking out about, <laughs> well, what's it going to be? Oh, it's like, uh, it's going to be like 12. It's like, oh, like there's a screenshot that he, that Jason sent him this morning. It's like negative 40 there. So like, just in case you, you thought this was as bad as it gets, it's not. Uh, this morning, I know I just said Happy Valentine's Day, and you're looking at the title, uh, More United Than Divided. Happy Valentine's Day. We're going to talk about division this morning, so uh, get ready for that. But it's good. It's good news. It's good news because our unity comes from Christ as the body of Christ, uh, and so the divisions of the world do not creep in or should not creep in. That's what we're going to talk about uh, this morning through the lens of Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15 is usually called the Jerusalem Council. I like assembly. It's the word there in Greek that's used to describe what's happening there. It's the same word for church, ecclesia, the called out ones. And, And I think it speaks to the purpose of what they're doing. There's a disagreement that arises that needs to be dealt with. There are factions of people in the church. I know that we don't have any idea what that would be like to be sitting in a church with people that you disagree with. I know we all always agree with everything that everyone says, right? Okay, that was a test. You failed. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, We, as members of the body, are not simply to avoid conflict. Avoiding conflict is not the answer. There are things that are going to happen that we are going to disagree about. It's probably happened already. Don't start Uh, throwing elbows or pointing fingers, okay? We don't need to do that. But we do need to acknowledge the fact that in Acts chapter 15 specifically, we're not talking about something that's happening from outside the church being forced inward. This is something that's happening within the church. These are believers, right? These are believers that are having these difficulties uh, interacting with each other, these these disagreements about theology, right, That, that, that needs to be addressed. And so that's what happens in Acts chapter 15. We're gonna read it in a minute, but I want that to be on our minds, that, that there is, uh, there are many things that we would say that we disagree with the larger culture about, and, and, and it has become, uh, maybe harder for some of us, it's become easier for me, I, I've just decided that. There are some things that I'm going to stand for that, that it's already a decision that I've made, and that has become easier uh, because the divisions between us and what the world looks like have become more clear, perhaps, than they ever have been, right? Uh, here's what's more difficult. When those of us, members of the body, in this room and, and without this room, right, when we have disagreements with each other, that's what scares me more because that's what can lead to more problems. It's not a problem for me to disagree with the world. I'm supposed to, right? I'm I'm supposed to have differences with them. We are going to have differences, but how we deal with it should look, again, different from how the world looks, and often it doesn't. We'll talk about some reasons why that happens, but let's read Acts chapter 15, starting in verse 1. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders were gathered together to consider this matter. 
And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, uh, with this the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it, that the remnant of of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from what has been strangled, and from blood." For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Will you pray with me? Father, as we uh, look at this idea of unity, even in the midst of disagreement and dissension and debate, God, I pray that we would uh, look to the scriptures, look to the unity that we are to have in the blood of Christ and not uh, use the world as our example. Uh, God, I pray that as we are set apart, as we are the called out ones, as we are the ones assembled in your name this morning, that we would be assembled with the same mind, same spirit, same action, uh, God, that uh, you have displayed to us through your son. And God, I pray that that would be what's on our minds and hearts this morning. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So, uh, a little bit of background. Uh, We have been going through Acts in our uh, young adults uh, services, uh, and so we're calling it the Acts of God, and we're not saying that to be in opposition to some of our Bibles that say Acts of the Apostles. These are things that the apostles are doing, but I think continually through Acts, what we see is God is the agent of everything that's happening. By the Spirit, he is leading people in their obedience to do these great and marvelous things that result in these explosions of faith, people coming to faith in Christ by the thousands in the early church. And so uh, when we start to see those, those, those big explosions of faith and the big expansions of the church, we start to see some factions develop. Two of the big factions are Jewish Christians and Gentiles. Christians. Jewish Christians are those that would have come from the Jewish faith, heard preaching in synagogues, heard preaching from Peter or even Paul, responded in faith and become Christians, become uh, followers of the way uh, as a result of, again, the Holy Spirit's action in the apostles' lives. Same thing with the Gentiles. There could have been any number of ways Gentiles could have been connected to synagogues or even to outside the temple worship in Jerusalem. They could have had some connection, some uh, knowledge of the Jewish faith before, or they could have had completely no knowledge. They could have been completely pagan before this and come to faith in Christ, again, as a result of the preaching of the early church, the proclamation of the gospel, the leading of the Holy Spirit, the falling of the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles, how Peter is talking about it. And so really everything that's happened in Acts has led up to this point. We have seen the mission statement in Acts, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We've seen that happen in Jerusalem. We've seen it happen in the region of Judea. We've seen it happen to the Samaritans. We've seen it happen now to the Gentiles through Peter's preaching, uh, uh, Acts chapter 10 and 11, and he comes back and, and reports to the church in Jerusalem what's been happening. We've seen now at this point, we've seen the first missionary journey of uh, Paul and uh, Barnabas uh, that, that goes up through uh, a lot of these uh, Galatian churches by the end of it and all the way back down, uh, coming back to Antioch. And so before chapter 15, that's where we are. We're in Antioch and we, we see these men come that are uh, preaching a gospel that is contrary to faith in Christ alone. And so we have to start 
uh, deciding this question for ourselves in the church. And so here's how we usually frame that discussion, that these people come and they're completely uh, off kilter, they're completely out of whack, and they're trying to add these things to salvation, so they're just wrong and we need to tell them to shut up and everything will be fine. And, and Paul does get there, right? When he's writing to the Galatians, he's, he's saying really harsh things, like, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you to follow another gospel? He, he does get there. But at this point, I see it functioning a little bit more of a conversation. There are people who are wrong. They need to be told that they're wrong. You can't add something to salvation. You can't add something to Jesus because Jesus is all that you need for faith, right? That's, that's, that's what we're talking about. The grace of Christ is, is how we're going to be saved. That's what Peter's saying. But they are having a conversation. If we'll look at uh, verse 5, some believers, who's saying these things? Some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them in order to keep the law of Moses. Now they're wrong, but this is within the church. This is something that they need to decide among themselves. And so the Jerusalem apostles, the elders, people, uh, the Christians from Antioch, who's now gonna become the sending center, Antioch's north of Jerusalem. Uh, we, we say we're going up from Jerusalem and down to Jerusalem all the time just because it's the, the Temple Mount's on a mountain. So uh, Antioch is north of Jerusalem. We're going down to Jerusalem and we're, we're meeting in this council, in this assembly, and we're deciding this once and for all. What are we gonna require of the Gentiles? What are we gonna do as Jewish Christians to be a part of that fellowship? And it is all happening because of this truth. Conflicts will arise. Nobody needs to be convinced of that, right? Uh, I was talking to somebody recently that was reading uh, a biography that they were so surprised it was a, it was a biography of a famous Christian that's talking about a church split over something completely meaningless, something like what a building is going to look like or, or something that was completely could have been resolved. And he was so surprised to hear this because he'd never experienced that, that like many of us probably have in this room or known stories about different divisions and things that rise up that, that should not divide us but end up dividing us anyway. Now this, you could, you could make the argument, this is something that we should be standing up against. We should, be, we should be disagreeing with the men who come and say, hey, you need to be circumcised, you need to add that to your salvation. But there is a way that they are corrected here that's part of this community that's, that, that we make this decision together. We're not avoiding the conflict and we're not just saying sit down and shut up. We're, we, we are having a conversation. We'll, let, let's talk about what that means and let's talk about what this means and we'll come to a decision. Let's hear from Paul and Barnabas. Let's hear from Peter. Let's hear from James. What is it that we are saying our salvation emanates from, from Christ and Christ alone? And now we as a community have decided that because we decided to deal with the conflict. I know uh, people from other faith traditions, uh, uh, one specifically has told me that it's a Christian tradition. In, in their faith tradition, every decision they make is 100% unanimous. And I was like, will you come to a Baptist business meeting and tell us how you do that? <laughs> you know how it's unanimous? Everybody that disagrees before they take the vote leaves the room. That's not unanimous. <laughs> That's not a healthy way to deal with conflict. And those aren't decisions that everybody's making, right? I see in the early church something, a decision that needs to be made. Somebody's gonna need to hear that they're wrong. Somebody that's gonna need to hear that they're right. Both people are gonna, both sides of the issue are gonna have to do something to get to that point that there is a process. There's a process that's actually laid out in scripture. I don't know if you know this, but Jesus talks about it in Matthew 18. The brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Not on Facebook. <laughs> Sorry, I, it's not COVID. It's... <laughs> if he listens to you, you have gained a brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you. Not so you can gang up on him so that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses, but really for the purpose in verse 17 of Matthew 18, if he refuses to listen to them, take them along with you because there's something that, that he needs to be convinced of, that you care about this person. 
If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, not tell it to the church. Bring it before your faith community. Because church discipline is a thing. We don't like to talk about it. We don't do it anymore a lot of times. We do it. Many churches don't. The purpose of it is reconciliation and redemption. It's not to show somebody how wrong they are. It's not to hang on to our want to be right. When Paul talks about the uh, sexually immoral man at Corinth, when Paul talks about Alexander and Hymenaeus being handed over to Satan, that's what he says. I I imagine myself writing something on on like Calvary letterhead. Uh, This is just to inform you I'm handing you over to Satan. I think that would be received well. Probably not. Those are the words that Paul uses and he gives his reasoning for Alexander and Hymenaeus. It's so that they may learn not to blaspheme so that there is something that happens in their life that's not happening now that we have the opportunity and responsibility to take care of. Again, not so we can be right because we love them. I have broken up how Jesus talks about conflict in Matthew 18 like this. Number one, the way that we deal with conflict is to put light on it, not to put it in the dark, not to ignore it, not to act like it doesn't exist. Untreated wounds fester for a reason. I don't know if you've heard, but Fixer Upper is back. You gotta pay like the fee for Discovery Plus or whatever, but Chip and Joanna, they're, 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 they're improving houses again. Like on the first episode, uh, which I may or may not have watched the day it came out, (laughs) they open up this house that hasn't been open in a while and it reminded me, I I had like Harvey flashbacks, right? Of, yeah, you go in a house that hasn't been open like people who haven't been in there for months and and we all know what that looks like. Because when something's wrong, being closed off and in the dark will not solve it. It will make it worse. Throw some light on it. Take it to them. I have people come to me all the time. Hey, I got a problem with this person. Have you talked to them about it? Well, no. Bye. That's your first step. I'm not your first step. Second step, expand your circle with godly counsel. Take two or three with you. Again, not to gang up, but for the purpose of having them listen. And if it comes to it, being able to say what happened, but really for the purpose of having them listen. Number three, make proper use of your faith community. Bring it before the church when and if necessary. This doesn't mean put everybody on blast. This doesn't mean that prayer requests turn into gossip hour. Did you hear what happened to... And number four, trust God with the result. When it comes time to wash your hands of it, you have done everything that you need to do. But we skip all those steps and we're like, I guess nothing's gonna happen. Conflict arises, it's gonna cause us to do something, it's gonna cause us to take action. This is Bob Gibson. He uh, was a pitcher for the Cardinals in the 60s and 70s. Uh, Specifically in 1968, he had an ERA of under two along with seven other pitchers. If you don't know what that means, that means when he pitched, people didn't hit home runs a lot. Like almost not at all. (laughs) It was the year of the pitcher. So much so, and I know it happens all the time now, but they changed the rules of baseball. The mound used to be 15 inches, now it's 10 inches. The strike zone used to be from your shoulders down, now it's from your armpits down. Strike zone used to be a lot wider too, now it's shorter. They changed the rules. Pretty soon they're gonna put a T on there and 
People go to baseball games when people get home runs. That's why they did it. But, but really the result of it was people could pitch well and now people could hit well too. Only one of those things happened in 1968. The leading batting average in 1968 was a 301. That was the one who got the batting average award. Mickey Mantle batted a 217. Mickey Mantle, he had the best average on the Yankees. They changed the rules to make room for other people. There was a problem. And the solution caused them to move. Because ultimately, especially within the community of faith, unity is possible. Brian Wellborn made this graphic, uh, and some p- people were confused about why are we talking about boxing gloves? We're not supposed to be hitting each other, right? The boxing gloves are hanging up, right? They're not on our fists. I'm done with them. The same way, perhaps, if you want to think about it, that the sign of the covenant in Genesis 6 through 9 is the Lord hanging his bow in the clouds. It's not just because rainbows are pretty, they are. It's it's a bow and arrow that he's hanging in the clouds. He's hanging his bow in the clouds because he is no longer at enmity with us because we're looking forward through the covenant of Noah to the Christ. He's putting his weapons of war up. When he has cause and reason to make war with us, he chooses to put his weapons of war up. That he has every right to use against us. Unity is possible. They hear from many voices. They hear from the people that we're supposed to disagree with. If I'm Luke and I'm writing this, I'm taking their, I'm taking their stuff out, right? We don't need to hear from them. They're wrong. Every part of the conversation is in here. Purposefully. It's necessary for us to circumcise them. It's necessary for them to keep the law of Moses. We see Paul in several situations completely, vehemently argue against this. You know what we also see him do? Circumcise Timothy. You know what we also see him do? Take the temple rites of the Nazarite vow in Acts chapter 21. Timothy does not need to be circumcised for his salvation. Paul does not need to pay the temple tax. You know why he does it in each situation? Because he has become all things to all people that he may save some. Timothy is circumcised not because it's beneficial for his salvation. Timothy is circumcised because he knows that he is going to be a missionary not just to Gentiles but to Jews. And he is half Jewish himself. Paul opposes those who want to circumcise Titus. He's not making a a fast and loose judgment here. Sometimes I'm this way, sometimes I'm that way. He's doing what it takes for the community to thrive. And that causes him to act in different ways in different situations. Because he recognizes the diversity present in the church, the diversity that's present in this room. Who has a coin? Nobody. Coins are little pieces of metal that we used to cut circles in and put presidents' faces on them. Um, This one has Abraham Lincoln's face. It says, in God we trust at the top, and we do. It says, liberty just to the left of him, uh, because that's important to us. It has the year that it's minted. This is a 1979. On the back, it says United States of America, one cent. And it says something there at the top. It's the same thing that it says on the back of the quarter. It's Latin. E pluribus unum. Out of many, one. When we were deciding what types of mottos we would apply to specifically the seal of the United States, 
this was one that was suggested. By an immigrant named Pierre Eugene de Cimetière. The country of people from other countries. Out of many, one. It's uh, 13 letters if you're counting. It has to do with the 13 colonies. This is the sketch that became the seal of the United States. But you know that, like shield where the, with the eagle, right? Um, that's the eye of providence that's on the back of the $1 bill. Those are the 13 colonies. Pioneer and Columbia, the, the female personification of America. At the bottom, E Pluribus Unum. So that we would be reminded that we are more than just ourselves. Now, we can make that application to our country, but that's not what we're talking about this morning. I'm talking about the church. De Cimitar became a historian, one of the first in America. He started what was the first American Natural History Museum. It's not often billed that way because it had to be sold. And he died in financial ruin because no one was interested. He would collect like pamphlets about the American Revolution and about independence, and he would seek out these donations so that people would remember who we were and where we came from, and nobody was interested. He wants to remember that out of many, we are one, that there was a before for you, and there was a before for me, but now there's a now, and it's different than my before. It's what Paul wants to remind the church of over and over again. Put off your old self that looks like the world, that divides like the world, that, that lives into the barriers that the world puts up. And put on the new. Your new creation status equals new citizenship. People think that uh, the cemeter borrowed the phrase from Augustine, but Augustine was actually quoting Cicero, and Cicero is actually quoting Pythagoras, and this is what Pythagoras says. When each person loves the other as much as himself, it makes one out of many. Unity is not only possible, it's the goal. Not to be right, not to have even your voice heard over the masses. James is right, Peter's right. The point is, how are we gonna be a community? And this is how it ends. And this has always been strange to me. We, we, we spend this whole long time, Peter says, hey, we, we've seen how God has, has, has moved among the Gentiles. I came, this is, I mean, this is probably years and years after the fact that Peter has witnessed to the Gentiles and seen the Holy Spirit fall on them and come back and told the church about it. Uh, we see the way that uh, the first missionary journey went for Paul and Barnabas, and we see them get to say that now to the assembled ones there in Jerusalem. Now we see James say, yeah, this sounds great. And you know what? It sounds a lot like the scriptures that we know really well about how God's talking uh, about, again, he's quoting from Amos, he's quoting from Jeremiah, he's, he's probably quoting from Daniel some. Uh, he, he's, he's quoting these scriptures that talk about God gathering people from all different ethnicities, from all different nations to himself because it's not based on their nation or their ethnicity. It's based on what God has done on behalf of them, which is the same thing that he's done on behalf of us. And after James says this, it's this beautiful speech. He says, let's write him a letter and tell them what they should and should not be doing. <laughs> when, I, when I read this at first, it seems like that part doesn't fit. There's nothing that you should add to your salvation, but you know what? You should probably not stay away from idols, you know. 
Sexual immorality, also bad. Don't strangle anything. Stop ordering your steaks rare also because blood. What, what's with this list? There, there is a moral uh, application to several of these things, but there's probably also a, uh, a ritualistic pagan worship that he's talking about. And so why, why do the Gentiles not have to be circumcised, but they do now have to have all of these things added, it seems like, to what, what James is saying. It's not necessary for your salvation, but you should probably continue to do this. Well, not only is there going to be conflict that needs to be dealt with, not only is unity possible, but it may cost you something. I wish I could change this. It will cost you something. <laughs> It's going to cost the Jewish Christians something to let go of their old prejudices, to eat with tax collectors and sinners and Gentiles, to, to experience table fellowship with them. That's really what we're talking about here. It's, it's not just the fact that there's a ritual uncleanness there, although we'll, we'll deal with that, but we're going to place that at the feet of the Gentiles. What's at the feet of the Jews is, these are your people. Sup with them, eat with them, fellowship with them, because all of these fellowship meals that were happening in the early church were likely centered around communion, the Lord's Supper, remembrance of the sacrifice that Christ made on behalf of us. And so that's what it's going to cost the Jewish Christians. The very end of this, the letter that they send out becomes a circular letter that they send out that they take with them on the second missionary journey. Includes all of these things that likely also have to do with ritualistic pagan worship for Gentiles to follow. And so they don't say to the people, hey, to the Jewish Christians, hey, we should, we should, we should make some, some moral qualifications for these new believers. They don't say, no, that's dumb. They make moral qualifications, not for their salvation, but things that they should be doing. At the end of the letter, it doesn't say, do these things and you will be saved. What does it say? It's not in our text for today. But if you read ahead, at the end of the letter, do all this and you will do well. You will do well because if you avoid these things, you can now have fellowship with your Jewish brothers and sisters. Because here's the other thing, we're not going to ask them to stop doing it. That's what's crazy. Right? To us, we're not asking the Jewish Christians to stop everything that they want to do as part of their Jewish faith. We're not asking them to stop. We're not saying it's necessary for their salvation, but there's something that they desire to do that's a part of their faith that you're going to have to do something to be a part of fellowship with them. Looks a lot like Paul taking on the temple tax. Looks a lot like Paul circumcising Timothy. Looks a lot like Paul standing up for Titus that we're going to have to do things to bend towards each other so we can extend that grace that was extended to us. Because it will cost us something. This handsome young fella gave a speech in 1962 in September at Rice University. Anybody remember what it was about? We go to the moon, not because it is easy, but because it is hot. The moon speech uh, is like studied by uh, public speaking classes in colleges because of the way that it's structured. He quotes uh, the founding of the Plymouth Colony. He quotes... Uh, George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, when he asked why he wanted to climb it, George Mallory said, because it is there. Because of the challenge. We choose to do these things because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one that we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. Great speech. 
He made the speech in 1962, he was dead in 1963. He said in the speech, we will go to the moon and do other things by the end of this decade. We went to the moon in 1969. We chose to do it because we decided it was worth it. It was going to cost immeasurable amounts of spending. It was going to cost human lives. We decided it was a worthy endeavor for exploration, for the scientific discoveries. We still do experiments on the International Space Station that we can't do here that that further medicinal studies, all kinds of things because we're in space. Why care about reaching across, this is within the community of faith, reaching across to somebody who who disagrees with me, who has a problem with me, who I have a problem with. Why care? Why do that? Why not just do what's easier and what we probably do and ignore it? Because it is hard, because it is the right way to do it, it will be difficult. Let's get together and talk about all the things that we disagree about. I, I don't know if, like, <laughs> if, we, if I put that meeting on the schedule, probably me, myself, and I. We don't do that. We have to be formed. We have to be molded. We have to, te- we have to come away from our worldly understanding of I have a problem with this person and so you're dead to me and come to the understanding that there is something that Christ has for us that is, that is so far above our petty grievances and differences. If we just allow that to take root, if we do the hard work of building bridges instead of building barriers, then we can see the way that he can use our faithfulness. We can be taught. Uh, my grandpa taught me a lot of things. He taught me lo- almost everything that you could do to fix a house. Uh, he passed away this Thursday. He's in the hospital for three months. He, he was having extreme trouble breathing. His, his lungs have not been what they should be for years. Um, In the hospital, he would tell me, like, I I would still have questions on how to fix things, like my washer broke. (laughs) And he would, like, that would be, like, one of the things that he wants to spend time (laughs) talking about. He taught my dad how to do a three-way switch in the hospital. Like, he's doing some lighting in his house. (laughs) My favorite thing he taught me is what's called, uh, and he never used this word, but it's what he displayed, it's equanimity. Equanimity is used to talk about like a, a calm, self-assured way of going about life. And it's used in this sort of uh, secular, almost meaningless way. That's not how I mean it. It has great meaning for me because his equanimity stemmed from his faith. When he was in the hospital and it looked like it wasn't going to get better, he said, I guess 83 is how long I live. And he put his hands behind, he literally put his hands behind his back and lay back like he's in a hammock. And I was like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> there's, not, there's nothing wrong with him. It's what's right with him and what's wrong with us. Because he realized, he knew his faith was not in this world. We had to ha- I got to have great conversations with my grandfather about his faith that I never had before. Not because he didn't want to talk about it, just because he knew. He, he was secure in whatever happened to him. 
because his faith was in Christ and Christ alone. So he could get the worst news he's ever gotten in his life and then sit back and turn on gun smoke. <laughs> he wasn't worried about it. We worry about so much that doesn't matter. So much that's temporary, that's fleeting. We lose so much time based off of stupid stuff. I was looking for a better word, but there's not one. Why go to the moon? Why seek reconciliation? Why do the hard work of life together when it means that you're going to have to give something of yourself? Because all of that stuff, all that stuff we're worried about is meaningless compared to the eternal glory that is to be revealed in us. The reason my grandfather could lie back and say, I'm fine. His body's temporary. We can be in one accord with our mission, in one voice with our proclamation, in one spirit with our action, and we can start today. If you'll rise with me as they come for our final song. On this Valentine's Day, 2021, the eve of whatever is going to happen tomorrow, I don't know, I'm getting flashbacks to the ice storm, but. I think equanimity would be a word that should, could be on our hearts and lips as we go to this place. Bring it. What is it to us if God be for us who can be against us? What is it to us if the entire world is against us? What is it to us if there's something between my brother and my sister that I know can be solved right before I leave this place? What's going to stand in the way of that? Remember, please, to be praying for uh, Vicki and Nathan. Uh, Nathan's still quarantining. Uh, now Melissa, uh, Edgerly, and, and Justin are quarantining as well. Please continue to be in prayer uh, for them. Uh, because of concerns about safety and weather, we're not going to have any uh, evening activities uh, tonight. Uh, the church office will be closed tomorrow, but hopefully after that we'll be uh, in the offices if you have any needs uh, that we need to know about. Um, but my prayer for us this week is that regardless of everything else going on, that we would know that our faith, that our hope is secure and that would guide us not just to a proper understanding of things, but a proper way of living and moving.